So, how hard is it to get a robot to recognize an object using a camera? I mean, I've got a Raspberry Pi, I've got a webcam, and I've got an open CV. Surely it's easy, right? Right. In today's episode, I want to try and give you an introduction to both image processing as well as object recognition. Although, I should be upfront, the two don't necessarily have to go together. I mean, there are two separate things. But the point is with object recognition, you can apply that to uh, other sensors, not just imaging. You can apply that to ultrasounds, infrared. Basically, it's the concept of trying to recognize object within the data set that you have. So the other thing I want to be upfront is that it's been nearly 10 to 11 years since I last worked in this project. I know that's a long time. Technology has advanced. There's loads of improvements. And the other thing I want to um, kind of be upfront about is that the reason why I'm doing this series of videos is both because uh, I'm passionate about image processing. Uh, I want to get back into it, but I do have a project that I'm working on, on, my, on for my company, uh, which hopefully other people might find interesting, where I'm trying to kind of use that platform as a way to rediscover some of the stuff that I did back 10 to 11 years ago, and maybe even get to a point where I've got different versions explaining how you can move from one to another. Now, that said, it is very easy to get a cheap robot platform with an Arduino on it, a Raspberry Pi, webcam, and using OpenCV to do all this stuff. But what I'm hoping to achieve with my little platform is to provide people a simpler system that gives them access to the lower level stuff that they, so they can actually learn that if they choose to because it's easy to use existing libraries out there but sometimes those libraries may not quite do what you want to do and if you want to improve from it then it pays to actually understand the concept as well as understanding where the math are coming from and I'll be upfront I'm not too keen on having to go through math but you know at the end of the day it's one of those things where if he does exactly what I want, I'm willing to put 100% time to get that working and understanding how it works. So at the very least, this episode will give you an introduction, maybe whet your appetite and maybe even give you enough information about some of the free tools you can use right now to try and play around and see whether this is something you actually do want to do or not. But the whole point is to try and introduce this new project, the, hope, the, the introduction to the image processing and maybe with the upcoming videos that I'm going to be releasing as well as the future pod, uh, podcast episodes. Uh, I will be going through and explaining some of the stuff I've been doing with the robot and basically talk about some of the stuff that I end up discovering because to be honest, there's a lot of new stuff for image processing um, tools, libraries and stuff like that that I'm not aware of. Um, you know, It's one of those things I don't know about them, but when I do discover them and, and I, find, I find them useful, I want to talk about them and explain that to people. So so that said, without wasting any more of your time, I'm going to try and quickly explain about the project that I first worked on, which had image processing on and what I did to achieve that. And hopefully that will give you some understanding on what how, how image processing kind of works before I start going through, if we've got time, talk about the current project that I have and explain how, how we're going to use some of those tools or techniques on that. The first project I worked on, this was 10 to 11 years ago. Uh, it was a third year project that I did for my university. Um, it was one of those projects where if you've been to Leeds University, or I'm not sure if they actually still do this right now, but on that year, you had to select a project from one of the lecturers. And I was lucky to find that my lecturer had a robot, which was the project was called Smart Robot. See the um, the, the the originality of the name there, Smart Robot, where the previous person I worked on uh, was playing around experimenting with image processing. And when I read that description, I thought to myself, that is exactly the project I want to play with. It's going to be difficult enough and interesting enough for me to try something new. Lo and behold, it was difficult. It was definitely difficult. And if it wasn't for a friend of mine, I probably wouldn't have succeeded on achieving the final goal of the project, which was to get it to recognize an object. The previous person that took that had the project didn't actually get as far as actually recognizing an object. It was playing with things like edge detection, which I, I will be talking about in a minute anyway about, about that. Although, to be honest, I didn't really even bother doing edge detection. I actually did something far, far simpler, and which may actually be a good starting point for a lot of people. So the idea behind the robot was to try and get it to be autonomous and to try and get it to recognize objects. Uh, I say objects, I kind of relax that description or the definition later on because you kind of had to, at least for the project I'm starting with. And it basically had to react to it. And one of the big problems that I had, uh, and often you tend to, you can still find this in this case anyway, um, is where do you process that image? And 10 to 11 years ago, processing that, that amount of data on a PIC micro was pretty much unheard of. There was no cheap microcontrollers you can use at the time, at least within that I can actually access as a one person, as a you know one man pan kind of thing, to process that image. Um, a lot of the stuff that I found were all basically required you to actually have a small laptop 
uh, on top of a platform and it ended up being quite big and I wanted it to be small and I wanted it to be light and I wanted it to be cheap. Mostly because to be honest, at the time, third year project, they only give you so much money within the budget and even then you have to ask them to pay you back once you've spent that money. And even till today, they still owe me money and I, they were kind of resentment because that I was told that anyway, I, I'm gonna stop there. So I had those requirements. And so one of the things you could do uh, and what I did is if you wanna set up your own project, is that I got myself a cheap RF um, camera from eBay. Uh, then I got a receiver to go with that. And then that receiver, I put it on an S-Video, um, I think it was PAL. It will be because it's in the UK. I can't remember if I ended up buying an American one by mistake or, uh, I, yeah, anyway. I, I put it on a S-Video uh, connection and then that was uh, fed through to a TV capture card, which was a USB TV capture card, which was read by my laptop. And my laptop saw that as a webcam and then at the time I was programming in Visual Basic Express. Uh, I think it was just called, yeah, it was Visual, Express, uh, Visual Basic Express. And then I wrote a library that allowed me to read the image from a webcam, or take a snapshot from the webcam. And then that library also allowed me to go through pixel by pixel and do whatever I want to the image. So that was the setup that I had. Um, there's a lot of better setups out there and, uh, that you can go for, but that was a good way, that was a good thing because it meant that the processing was done on the computer uh, off the robo and the robots can be kept light and it can be mobile. Disadvantage, the robot can't really go too far because the RF connection isn't that strong and if you try and go to a different room, even the door itself can have an, an effect on the quality of the image, which in turn will have an effect on the quality of the, uh, well, in the quality of the image, which means the processing may have issues. Um, so there was an issue, you know, there, that, there was that requirement. So it's kind of nice that nowadays you can get yourself a Raspberry Pi with a um, webcam right, you know, right onto the actual board itself, so you don't have the issue. So the quality or the only noise you're going to get from the camera will be hopefully off the camera itself rather than just RF issues. And the other issue I had, which you, you might find kind of funny, because it was RF, um, the RF module that I had that picked up from that was that was picking up the signal from the webcam was very sensitive to two things: both vibration. So if you tap on the table too hard the actual little knob that you use to adjust the frequency band that it picks up the, the webcam from, made it can shift it just enough to actually cause the camera to lose signal. And the other one was temperature. If the, if it was too cold, again, you have to readjust it. It was just a constant battle. Every time someone, I wanted to demo this to somebody else, I had to first thing, like, I guess you, it's like a flight log, I guess you can say. First thing, set the, set the frequency, check that it's working, get the best signal you can. Oh no, somebody had an idea about using something within the same frequency, I have to go and pick something else. Uh, and all that sort of stuff. And also the webcam, not the, cam the, the camera that I was using was powered by an Anvil battery and as the battery depletes, so did the circuitry get affected and the signal got weaker, which again, noise. Oh. And you can, probably, you can probably understand that, um, I mean, uh, one of the first thing you need to learn about image processing is that noise is not your friend. And that's usually one of the first things you wanna try and sort out when you're doing any image processing, that and how small of the image can you get get away with processing rather than having to process. Because if you imagine, if you're processing a 20 megabit um, image, that's gonna take a long time to process as opposed to a, you know, like a 10 by 10 pixel or or even a VGA, so 680 by 480, no, so 640 by 80, 480, I forget. So that's another thing as well, like, you know, when you're trying to process an image, how small or how small of a data set can you get away with to try and get what you want? And you'll find that when you're doing image processing, that's the, the, that's the state of mind. You're trying to apply different algorithms that reduces the data quickly, reduces the data to the point where you only need to process or recognize a particular section as opposed to the whole thing. So when you want to recognize, when you want to track or recognize the red ball, then the, the first thing you want to do, you know, it's going to be red. Get rid of all the, all the other colors you can, go through the image and just discard any colors that you're not going to be using and only be left with what's red. And then the next step after that will be trying to uh, go further with that, but I, I'm going to stop there because I feel like I'm skipping a, ste a, a few steps there. So that was the robot that I was, I was doing on. So originally the, the, the idea was to try and recognize an object. So I thought, oh, how hard is it to get, get it to recognize a, you know, a Coca-Cola can or a, um, or a pen or anything like that. And it was difficult. Um, you know, I sat there thinking, I got this image, how do I do this? And very quickly I thought that maybe I should stick to primary colors. Because it might be because we got if you, it's quite a logical thing. You've got a picture, and usually one of the first things you find out when you have an, an image or you look at the raw data is that you've got three channels: red, blue, and green. 
and the red, blue and green, you think, oh, actually, it's going to be a ratio between the three. Can we just discard two of the channels, which is what I was just mentioning about get rid of everything but red. And that's one of the first things that you kind of thought, oh, if, if I can do that, what can I do to the object to make it that much easier or make this red you know, filtering out by colors uh, more relevant? One of the first things that I did was, okay, whatever the object's in front, everything else I'm going to assume is going to be white. And so the only thing I'm interested in is to be red. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid thing, actually. If In some particular applications, that can actually work. If you think about it, uh, imagine you've got a one of those um, mouse maze competitions you got to do. Uh, it's usually those mouse mazes tend to just be all white, and you're trying to recognize what's in front of you. It makes it a lot easier when everything is just a single color, and the thing you're looking for is a particular thing that just stands out very brightly. There you go. You can just go through pixel by pixel and get rid of that. But that's not enough. I mean, I'll be the first thing you really need to remember is that uh, all images aren't going to be perfect. It's very rare that you're going to have an image that comes through, at least from a cheap module camera. I don't know what the high-end super duper ones are like, but even then they got some sort of filtering on that. You need to apply some sort of filter to try and remove information you don't want. For example, uh, light noise. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can try and smooth out the image. So imagine this. Imagine you got, if you ever take a picture, so take your phone, for example, and take a picture of a black uh, object or everything so that everything that the camera can only see is black take a picture of that and then bring it to your computer and zoom into it to pixel levels and you soon realize <clears throat> that it's not actually perfectly black you start seeing the occasional blips here and there that's a little bit brighter than black and or in, or in some bad situation you might actually just get like a uh, like a uh, deformity or an issue with the lens you might actually be able to see that as well and so you can't really rely on the color being correct so you have to apply a filter so one of the things you can do and which was the filtering that I, I, I did at the time, was compare pixels around it. So if imagine if you were to, 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 to divide, if you were to say, for example, take the first four pixels on the top left corner and then take an average of those four pixels and set the middle pixel to that color or set or maybe even set all of them to the same color if you want to try and keep as much of that uh, object. Actually, you have to do that. You have to take those. No, it won't be four pixels. That would be quite uh, awkward. I think at the time, to speed it up, I, well, to speed it up, you can increase the number of pixels, but just imagine four pixels, top left corner, and you look at those, those, four, those first four pixels, and you say, okay, the average uh, RGB color of all of them is going to be this color, and you apply to all of them. And you can do various different types of averaging. You can do basically sum of all of, of four pixels and divide it by four, and then that value will be your average, and you do that to all three channels, and you apply it. And then what you do is you increment, the, you move to the left, by maybe another four pixels and apply the same filter and you just go through all the pixels, you know, um, through a four, for a nested for loop of, okay, move to the, to the right or move to the next four, four pixels and apply a filter again and so on. And you find that actually that will help quite a lot uh, with regards to try and move the, the, the noise. It just even that basic filtering will do it. But then also you find that actually that's a bit, it can only apply, it, may, it might only apply a little bit, maybe the the noise signal, maybe that you've got like a, a deformity on the lens, might be bigger than four pixels, then it may not necessarily pick that up. Uh, you So you may actually have to just increase the number of pixels. So that's one thing you can do to try and filter out. So the next thing I did after that is once I've, I apply a filter, and I think at the time I, wait, I went for a weighted average, um, but uh, actually that was kind of, kind of like a bad thing. So basically uh, at the time I went with uh, eight by eight, and then basically took the first pixel's value. I mean, this I think this was really bad, but took, took the first pixel on that a eight by eight matrix, took that as the starting value. Then I moved on to the next one, and then averaged out. Uh, then I basically applied weighted value, value to that and applied it to the new value, and I just went through each one of them, and just basically went through. And that kind of basically essentially when I got to the final, um, as I'm going through all the pixels, when I get to the final one, the weighted average is going to have a value. Then I use that to apply to all the other eight pixels and say, okay. This is the new pixel value we're going to use. I can tell you now that was bad. That was really bad because one, I'm applying a weighted average, so I'm actually doing extra uh, computation per pixel. Uh, on top of that, you can't guarantee I should go through um, like a loop of all those pixels that actually the first uh, pixel is going to be the same pixel information as the other one. You're basically, assuming that whatever's around it in that vicinity is going to be pretty much the same object, and it isn't the case. Uh, it, that could be like a sharp edge going across those that uh, going across those um, that matrix, like. Some of the pixels might be the white background and then some of the pixels might actually be 
um, your actual object you're recognizing. So you actually end up getting like a blurred edge. So it may not necessarily be helpful in that regard. So you, you apply that. The point is you apply the filter and you remove as much of the noise. So the next thing I did, because um, I made the assumption that my object is going to be in a white background and it can be a particular color, it's going to be a primary color. I then basically said, okay, uh, check the color that I'm seeing on those, um, you know, go through all those pixels again. But this time we'll do a four by four again. So it's a four by four matrix. We start from the top left corner and say, okay, what is the average color on this? Which is the dominant? Oh, it's going to be green. All right, ignore all the other, all the other channels and leave the green and then move on to the next one. And then I did the same thing. And basically you get left, you end up being left with um, only the hard colors that have been left behind. And then what you could do, okay, now take an average of all those hard colors within the screen, you know, each of the ones, and basically group them up and basically tell me which of the three channels has the most of the same color appearing on the screen. And then when you've done that, you basically say, okay, in this case, the screen is primarily red. So therefore this is going to be a red object. So ignore all the other channels and you've got a red object. And then, and then you think, okay, that's enough. That's enough to f find out that actually what's in front of you is a red color as opposed to green color. But you have to be a bit smarter as well. You, you can't just go and say, okay, which is the greatest of the three channel. You, you have to also apply a filter, a threshold onto that. Say, okay, the, whichever's the, the greatest colors of the three, it needs to be greater than say 10 color shades. Otherwise we'll consider this as unknown because there's too much mixture between the two because if you imagine if the background is just white and there's no red object in front or any object for that matter then the number of colors for each channel might actually be ratio wise might be quite even between the two so if you apply a threshold saying anything greater than 10 number of pixels or 10 you know whatever it is then okay this there is no object in front and that's fine now the issue uh, I then presented myself is that I it's kind of okay that's color detection now I want to actually do shape detection, so one step further. And what I did basically, I, 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 went, I moved away from having a white background and then basically said, okay, so now what we'll do is we'll assume that the background or anything around, around the screen um, is going to be so mixed that actually the number of red and blue and green will even out anyway. And the only, off, the only balance that's gonna offset the, the three channels or the overall average towards the end is going to be the solid color that I put in front. Okay, so we've got that, fine. So that means I can't just stand in front, of, in front of the camera while showing it this object that I wanted to detect. Good, fine. What about the shape recognition? Because I don't just wanna, I don't wanna limit the, the, um, the setup to just red, blue, and green. I want my robot to do more than just three different commands. So I wanna do shape recognition. And I looked into, I went through all the different algorithms you can apply, and there's some really good stuff out there, which I can't quite remember what, they, what they're called, but I, to be honest, we will eventually, if, if not but if not in the next few episodes, it'll probably be in the next, in the future episodes when I expand from this topic, we'll actually cover that side of things actually. But, but the point is, when I was working on this project on this robot, I, you know, I couldn't find something that actually worked well for me, or I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to kind of dive into it. So I thought, all right, in this case, I'll just do what I normally do, and that is find my friend and try and throw ideas of what, what we can do to try and solve the issue. And he had this really good idea, uh, and that was that for, because he's, he does a lot of um, game development or personal project that he does on that, and he was like saying, well, why don't you just do what um, uh, object collision detection is done on games? Basically, try and draw, try and find out what the area of that pixel is, and then that area will tell you what shape it is. Crudely, but it can. And I thought, okay, so how do we do that? And he said, well, why don't you just plot it? And I thought, okay, that actually makes sense. If I plot in a graph, um, and if I plot it uh, color versus um, pixel density, or the number of pixels, um, then that should tell me, if you, know, if, if you were to actually try and figure out an area on the curve, that should tell me which of the three shapes it's likely to be. But there's a few issues with that, but let's assume that the object stood in front of the robot at exact distance. Uh, if you were to present a square shape at the same distance, uh, then you were to present a triangle or a circle, the areas are gonna, the, the number of pixels that they'll take up, take up in front of the camera will vary between the three based on their particular shape. As you can imagine, the uh, square will take up the most pixels, followed by the circle, then the diamond, or the square, uh, sorry, triangle in this case. 
So I thought, okay, that's kind of clever. Why, why not? Let's give that a go. And so I did. I plotted a graph, and you had, and you'll see it that the um, whenever you take a picture of a triangle, it tends to fall in a particular location within that chart. And whenever you take a picture of the circle, it falls further up, and in the square, even further up. And then there were other factors that were affecting it. For example, um, things like um, what's it called. There are other factors that are affecting it, and there was things like um, what's the right term for it as well. Uh, the brightness, uh, the well, basically the environment affects the quality of the picture, which affects the number of pixels that are actually being accurately picked up. And on top of that, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but when you're going through and picking out which color channels you're going to go for, the other issue you might have is that, yes, you have a threshold that tells you which color you will accept, which is green, which is blue, and so on. Those are going to let you down because they will let some positive and some um, some false positives and some um, some useful data that will be ignored as well. So that can have an effect. But if you plot it, they they will you know they they will actually tend to center around the average of what, what that image is going to look like. The other issue which you probably already figured out is going to be um, the distance the object is going to be to the robot will vary the number of pixels. Now, to be honest, at the time I didn't bother focusing too much on it because basically the way I I, I kind of figured and I know this sounds kind of bad. But when I was presenting the robot, what I would do is I would present the object into the, or I would present the block or the, at the, at the time I basically had some um, square cut out on, on, on a plastic sheet and then free, um, not free, there was no free printers for me to use them. Uh, it was a, a paper with a printout of the color that I want with whatever shape on, again, glued against that actual um, sheet of plastic. And basically all I did is basically brought the sheet in front of the, um, the camera and to detect it, the oh, the shape. So whenever I basically show the robot to the uh, to the teachers, I told them, okay, so there are issues, but this is my way of telling the robot do something. So what I would tell the robot is, here's the here's the shape. All right, if you detect it and do whatever you're going to do, and they were happy with that because that proved that there was some level of object recognition going on in there, or in this case, shape recognition uh, and color detection, and which is great. The, the point is, once you've got that, once you've got um, a means to try and get an average of what which are the three shapes you're dealing with. Um, I then went as far as actually programming commands to the robot, sending commands back to the robot saying, okay, I've detected a green triangle or a, gr or a blue triangle or a red square or whatever. And then the robot did actions based on that. So for example, for this robot that I did, or the robot that I did um, while I was at uni, uh, it basically did, it went to three different modes of operation based on the color and did different actions based on the shape. So if it was a, um, a blue square, then that told the robot to go and wander around the, the environment and avoid objects using the infrared sensor they had built in, and it did. Um, and then it's okay, if you now see um, a, I forget the color, I, used, I can't remember the exact sequence of colors and shapes, uh, but if you now see a red triangle, then stop there and wait for another command. Or if you see this particular color and square, then stop. Uh, and then spin around on the spot, which is fine. And to be honest, I'll be upfront. The, the the key thing for that for the when you're doing image recognition and stuff like that, or you go into that, is try and simplify the process as much as you can to prove that you can that you got something going, and then slowly add more difficulty to the project and try and expand from that. I, that's to be honest, it's quite similar to any projects you're working on. Start from the beginning and slowly work your way up through the you know making it more difficult or adding to the actual project. You know just. That's the sort of stuff that I'm kind of basically saying. Just start from the beginning and slowly build up. I mean, it's the same with any project. Um, but then again, for the application that I was doing or the for the robot, you probably think to yourself, well, yeah, okay. So if I move the, the shape too far away from the robot, I mean, as I mentioned this, it's not going to recognize it. That's fine. But to be honest, though, if you think about it this way, if you're looking at something in front of you, when if when the when the object gets this too distorted for you to understand it, you stop recognizing it, don't you? I mean, it's a lot less of a problem for humans because we tend to be quite um, I say humans like I'm a robot. It's less of a problem for us because you tend to kind of um, adjust and you tend to predict what the shape might actually look like if it's been distorted, which is not something that's been that's been built to the original um, project that I worked on. But that's that's probably the next step that you want to go. Up. What can you do to try and rebuild the picture? Um, but I mean, in all honesty, though, if I was to have put that um, that plastic, which was what I was doing, um, that bit of plastic with a shape anywhere in the room, eventually when it bumps into it and the camera sees it at the right angle 
and he said the right distance, it would have recognized and turned around and got back. But the key thing is that the distance that I programmed the robot to recognize those shapes were further out than the infrared sensors were. So the point is that the robot will keep driving towards an object and if it turns around, then chances are it won't be the object that's in front of it or it's been distorted to a point where the robot can't recognize it. And that was the other thing as well though, if you start rotating the shape, because it was a 2D shape that I was presenting it with, it will eventually get to a point where that triangle that no longer looks even enough for it to actually take up those pixels that it thinks that it's going to detect in the screen. But there are things that you can do though. Uh, you can actually add, uh, you can add more information to the object you're trying to recognize, uh, which is probably the, something else that you might consider doing. And that was actually something that I ended up doing with a friend of mine on the next project, which was for the fourth year. And it was a swarm robot project, which uh, I should kind of put a plug out there. It's what I'm actually also hoping to do with this robot that I'm developing for, uh, for myself actually is to get to do, get to do object recognitions to the point where it's recognizing the other brothers' robots because I'm hoping to build 10 of these. And then together program swarm-like um, uh, um, swarm -like behaviors so that they can actually achieve grander tasks. Um, I feel like I just uh, very briefly explained what swarms or the concept of swarm robots are about. Uh, let me try it again. I feel like I can do a better job. So, and I apologize that I'm going off topic, but you know, it, it, it's interesting anyway. So with um, a swarm robot or a swarm project, the idea is to try and get robots to do a task that they wouldn't normally be able to do on their own uh, by, well, they wouldn't be able to do it on their own when they're quite simplified robot. No, that was actually a worse explanation than the first one. Let me try again. So the point of a swarm robot is to try and get a lot of robots to, to achieve a grander task that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do together. Usually the robots tend to be quite dumb, but they don't have to be too dumb. But if you think about it, if you're trying to get a, a single robot to do something, you you either have to engineer quite a lot to that robot to be able to achieve that. For example, if you're trying to get a robot to pick up a one-ton object, you may have to actually you have to design the robot to be able to do that. Where potentially you could do is design smaller, cheaper, dumber robots that get together to pick up that object. So that's an example of a swarm robot. But that isn't necessarily the only thing you can do with swarm robots. There's other stuff. I mean, if you if you look at the um, the insect worlds, the ants, for example where they're always working together to achieve one task, deliver the food from one place to another, then you can do stuff like that. Maybe you can get a lot of swarm robots to try and pick up um, rubble from uh, you know, a disaster, for example, or even get a lot of robots to go out and clean up an area where you wouldn't be able to go as a human. But if you've got a lot of them acting together, coordinating together, achieving the same thing, they'll be able to actually move the smaller stuff together on their own, but then when they get to the larger object, they'll get together maybe move that. Or if, for example, which is what I'm kind of hoping to do, um, which isn't so much about physically moving something, it's more about physically recognizing something. Uh, if a robot finds something or a person or anything like that, uh, but he's not quite sure, it'd be kind of nice to see what happens when other robots get together and start recognizing and see what together they come up with of what they've just recognized. Anyway, so I'm going off topic there. So going back to the image processing, I talked about uh, oh yeah, so that was the technique that I applied. So if you wanted to actually try this out, you can very easily uh, do this yourself. You can go ahead and just get yourself, I mean, it's up to you, but if you can get yourself a Raspberry Pi, well, to be honest, you can just get yourself, go, go to a computer, uh, have an image, draw a shape, and then just try and write code that reads the pixels and just do some of the basic stuff there. Just very quickly go through, take an average of all the pixels and, and reapply back to the image and basically filter out any of the noise. And then once you've done that, Try and apply at that point, um, try and figure out which between the three colors um, is likely to be, uh, well, which of the three colors is, is kind of the, the more don uh, dominant with a, an apply filter. And then after that, take account of how many pixels are on the screen of that same color. And then with that, you can then go ahead and try and figure out or try and plot that and graph. Or maybe get your, your program, if you're, if, you're, if you're using Python or Node.js, get that to basically spit out the data or the profile. Which, to be honest, you kind of find that actually that's a lot more like a hysteresis when you start kind of creating a... Well, hysteresis tend to be more about the, the overall range of different colors that are the same uh, or appear, that appear often, but and I think, I, I think I've, I kind of butchered that as well. But anyway, it's fine. I'm, I'm sure I'll come back in another episode and explain a bit more about that. But just, yeah, log the data. Log um, how many color pixels that you've kind of spotted of the same range. And the key thing is their same range because the thing is, so the same red will have a different color um, color value, RGB value, based on brightness. So you're probably actually going to be better off, and this is the thing that I wish I'd done when I first worked in the project, is to take a hue color, a hue, well, worked out a hue value of each pixel and use that 
to, to, to apply the image processing because the problem is with RGB values. The RGB value, if you were to actually plot that in 3D space, you're actually going to have a variant of the same color based on brightness. So the brighter the room will have an effect on the color. And that was something that I was constantly having to battle with uh, when I was working on the project that I had to keep readjusting the uh, detection threshold to make sure that that room was fine for the robot to detect that particular object. And I even went as far as actually cr creating an LED white matrix um, or an array of LEDs, uh, white LEDs to kind of brighten the object to kind of make it more consistent. Where, to be honest, I wish I, if I'd known about, if I'd known about hue or the hue representation of colors, uh, that's basically the hue, the, the hue property of an, of, of an image, uh, basically that's away from, or kind of splits the difference between the colors and the saturations. Uh, so it doesn't matter how bright the object is, their color ratios choose to uh, choose to be the same thing. So if you've got an object that's red, uh, within obviously uh, within reasonable amount, uh, you can pretty much guarantee the red is going to reappear again, depending on the uh, you know how much brightness or well, how much light. Really doing a bad job here. The, so even if you do light up the room a lot brighter than when you originally set it up, the red should still pretty much be within the same range. So at that point, you've only got a single value to search for, as opposed to a range of red pixels that you, you you're filtering through so that is something that you might actually be better off doing if you're going to do this test yourself that once you filter out the image to actually convert the image to a hue representation of the same image and then go through and try and spot the color you're looking for now i will link up uh, the hue uh, spectrum color so you can see what it will look like and i'll also link up the um the wiki page explaining the difference between the RGVs and the uh, hue representation of the same image because that to me made a big difference when I was trying to understand the difference between uh, what well, made a big difference to me recently when I was trying to figure out how to actually optimize or avoid brightness issues on an object or brightness issues when I'm trying to detect colors although this was more for a color sensor as opposed to a camera but that this same thing would well the hue would definitely help trying to filter objects anyway so Anyway, so that's that. So hopefully the explanation of the robot that I did on my third year project, uh, that should kind of give you an understanding a little bit about image processing. So it's all about trying to get information from the, from the image. And the one thing that you tend to find when you do an image processing is that you're trying to reduce as much of the information as possible to, so that you don't have to do as much processing to extract, the, to extract the, well, the data you want, basically. And it's all about filtering and filtering and filtering. So I'll just keep saying that. So. I very briefly mentioned in the beginning about edge, de edge detection. Uh, so one method that uh, the person that was working on my project before, working on the robot that I took over before me, was using, uh, I'm going to apologize for butchering the name, but it's gonna be uh, his uh, canny edge detector. Uh, I think I said canny, right? Or canny, anyway. Uh, so it's by this guy called John F. Kenny? Or, yeah, John Kenny. And so this guy came up with a technique to try and detect edges from the image. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on how that works, but the point of that uh, algorithm or the point of the technique that he explained is that you're gonna go through the image, you're gonna try and filter out uh, the noise first, so apply some sort of smoothing. And then what you're gonna try and do is work, um, come up with the gradient, sorry. What you're gonna do is you're gonna try and, and the same method that you, that you went through filtering the image, so a four by four matrix, you're going to try and compare the pixels gradients, so the difference between the two. And when you have a sharp difference between them, you can potentially assume that that is an edge or, or a pixel that is likely to be an edge. If you then were to try and work out how big of a jump between the two color is, and if it's greater than X amount, then you consider it to be sharp. And then what you do is you draw uh, a pixel, which is either on or off. So you're essentially getting a binary representation of that. So in that pixel, you're now gonna say, okay, so these four pixels here make up one pixel and it's gonna be either on or off. On is an, is an edge, off is not an edge. And you're basically gonna end up with a black and white picture, which is four times smaller than it was originally because you're, you're basically creating one pixel for every four pixels that you find. And then you, move, you, you slowly move through uh, the array of pixels of the original picture once it's been filtered on that. And you keep doing that, you keep checking the pixels, what's the gradient between the two, if it's greater than this, uh, or if it's sharper than this, if the big step, then create a one uh, or a one binary. Or in this case, you can just do like a, a one one uh, FFFF if you're doing hex for white or zero 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 for black. And the point is, you're going to be left with a picture 
that's either going to be on or off. So it's a binary representation. And that will be your edges. And so the sharp changes will be edges. Everything that kind of merges together, for example, if, you, if you're looking at a person's face, for example. Well, actually, if you go back to the, um, uh, the shape of the red, or if you triangle or circle, if you've got a red circle in a white background, the point where the white and the red meet, that will be a sharp change in color. And then everything where it's continually following on by the same color, then that won't be a sharp edge. The, some of the issues that I found when I was replicating this person's project and it's an, it's an issue you have to keep applying other methods to do, and that is that, one, you're going to have quite a lot of noise in the pic on the uh, image that you have, which means that there will be edges that would kind of merge with other objects, and then there'll be edges that will be bro broken up. So if you were to actually take a picture and just draw a line around a person's head, for example, there'll be, there will be situations where those edges will be broken up because either there was too much noise in that area, um, there was too much noise in that area where it ended up breaking those two lines. So you're left with an image where it's still got noise in there. And so you have to go through that same image and try and reconnect some of those edges. And so I forget the name for it, but it's, you essentially, um, there's two techniques you need to apply. The first one is you build and then the second one is you corrode. And I'm sure I'm ruining the names here. Uh, the build is that you, tr you go through the image and you're trying to reconnect those edges. And the second one is once you've done that, you want to try and filter the image a little bit further by trying to remove useless edges that are just on their own left there. And so you apply a thing called corrode. And the way that works is that you go through the image again. And if a, if a particular edge is smaller than, say, two or three pixels, then you ignore it. If it's greater than whatever your threshold is, then you keep it and you're good to go. And that's kind of like a way to try and, and go towards the direction of object recognition. Because once you've got an edge of an object that's very well defined, then at that point you could potentially do something like I did, and that is, um, well, again, it still it will still have the same issues, but you can maybe take account of all the number of pixels that you found for that object, and then maybe use that to tell you if that's going to be a triangle, or a circle, or a square, because you would think that the square would, would have more pixels than the triangle and the circle and so on. Although with the circle, again, distance will be an issue. Anyway, so hopefully that was uh, enough to whet your appetite. Uh, so before I finish it off, the couple of things I want to mention which is tools that you can use. So if you got yourself a Raspberry Pi, uh, you don't really need to get yourself a webcam module. Uh, you can just get, sorry, a camera module. You can just get yourself a webcam, connect that in there. You can use, I mean, I will link it, link it up. There is an awesome website um, this guy put together. It basically goes through step-by-step -step of setting up both a Node.js Express server, um, setting up the, um, the OpenCV NPM package, of the module that, that allows you to actually uh, execute a lot of the OpenCV's um, built-in libraries. And then he actually also goes through showing you how to load an image using the Express web server. So, well, as far as you're concerned, it's a web page. Load an image, passing it back to the server and showing you how the server can then take that image and run it through all the different uh, libraries, or all the different functions built into OpenCV to detect a face or detect faces. It was actually quite funny to do. It's actually quite a fun the project to quickly, or well, uh, example code to put uh, to build and test, and just kind of find random images online and just see where it fails. At one point, basically, I took a picture of myself and it wouldn't recognize my face, but it just kept recognizing my elbow, because apparently that has its own ad ad entity. But, but to be honest, the only issue I had with it is that actually I wanted to know more about how that algorithm was, was uh, done. So I do, I am hoping that in my upcoming, uh, well, upcoming videos, which I haven't quite shot yet where I go through and start learning about that and explaining it, that I get to show you guys how, how that works. But at the very least, I'll provide a link to that page so that for those who are interested to just skip ahead and not even bother watching my videos, then you can just go ahead and go through that. So anyway, so that's that. The other thing I would suggest is, again, uh, you can do this on a Raspberry Pi or a computer, but I would definitely suggest getting one of those embedded computers or well, not so much because um, not so much because you can't do it on a computer, you can, but more because chances are, if you're if you're interested in image processing, you're also likely, if you're listening to my show, you're also likely to want to implement that on some sort of robot. And one of the things that I I, I was hoping to do at some point is uh, replicate this project this person did, which was get a Wally -E, um, model to actually track your face. Uh, so the actual little um, camera uh, camera eyes that it, that Wally -E has actually follows you. Uh, so that'd be kind of cool, but. Anyway, I'll put it out there anyway, uh, the links for that if you guys are interested. Um, they're pretty cool and it's pretty easy to actually get something up and running and working on that. 
um, especially if you've got like, a, a cheap servo and a webcam just glued together and get that to actually track, so that's kind of cool. Um, that said, with regards to the project that I'm currently working on for myself, um, the idea behind that, as I mentioned, is to try and experiment with swarm robots and image processing. Originally, I had planned to use a PIC32 uh, micro, which was, uh, I forget what it is, but it had, it had more than enough memory to both take a sample from the camera, run some processes, and then enough code left for you to actually execute what you want to do with it. The issue that I have with that is that there's a lot of little, little things that I want to do with the micro that may hinder, and that is more to do with the um, time it takes to process the image as well as the um, me oh, well, RAM for doing other stuff. So not just for, because th that's great, the, there's enough space to process an image, but might not have enough space there for me to apply some of the other stuff I want to do, such as neural networks. So I'm tempted now to redesign the board, or when I come to do the videos on that, to uh, pick a micro that has an external RAM, or uh, at least um, the functionality of connecting an external RAM so that we can expand that out, because it'd be kind of cool that you can just go for a much larger memory size, um, so you can have enough space for your um, to process the image, or enough space to store that image, and then run maybe a few different image samples. But more importantly, uh, there's enough space there for me to experiment with neural network, which uh, to start with, you can very easily, uh, I think I mentioned this on the previous episode, you can very easily um, do a very quick code for you know, testing out a, very, a single node, but I want to experiment with mul multiple of those. So, you know, like I was saying before, like once once I go, I repeat, once I repeat the process of, um, or repeat the experiment, that, or repeat, repeat the project that I did or when I originally put together the robot years ago, when I repeat that same uh, image processing techniques, I also want to try and see if I can feed some of that information back to a neural network and get it to actually start recognizing, okay, I fed you 10 triangles, you sh so you should know the average weight value for that triangle. And so therefore, in the future, when you find actually you've, you've already fed me this and I've, I've recognized this before, therefore this is triangle, then I, it'd be kind of nice to be able to teach it. Although, um, to make neural network useful, you really want to have a system that allows you to expand the number of nodes dynamically. So I'm not talking about, um, Sorry, I ended up making this more about uh, neural network. So it's, it's not useful just to have a fixed number of nodes. That's great. But when you're teaching a robot, you're actually using new no neurons every time you do that. So it'd be actually kind of cool to experiment with having every time you show a, a, a new image for the robot, it'd be kind of cool that it actually creates a new set of nodes for that image. So as time goes by and the more pictures you show it, the more nodes it ends up using. But it, I do understand that it will eventually get to a point where it'll end up using too much of the RAM so it'd be kind of cool to get it to actually discard the nodes that it hasn't used in a long time. So just like us kind of forgetting memories when we were kids, obviously we don't store exact footage of everything. I mean, I, 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 I'm yet to meet the person who has, um, uh, I forget their name for it, um, ident memory or anything like that. But we don't, you don't actually often store an exact footage of what happened to you in your, your life. You tend to kind of store a small bit of information. And it'd be kind of cool that to actually program this robot to us is going through and recognize an object and creating new new neural network. Sorry, I do apologize. I feel like uh, I've gone too much into neural network. But I should program it to um, learn new objects and it's creating new neural nodes um, that it's kind of, you know, been burning in there and kind of waiting it out, saying, okay, this object is triangle, therefore it's kind of burned this. It'd be kind of cool that as you start training new objects, it starts forgetting what the other one looks like. Not that actually it would be nice to have a robot that doesn't forget things, but uh, when you have an embedded platform, you have to compromise somewhere. But that said, though, I, I am hoping that at some point that once I got this all up and running and it's all working as, 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 as I'm intending it for it to, uh, to kind of move on to the next step, and that is maybe uh, improving performance or maybe even, and hopefully, experiment with other uh, type of image processing that people may have worked on. And if I get to a point where I understand enough of the um, of, of all the techniques, then I could just start experimenting with some of the ones that I want to play with. But or kind of create my own kind of thing, but that's for another day anyway. I think I have taken enough of your time, so I'm going to leave it there. So, as always, uh, feel free, if you uh, if you do like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. There's loads of different ways to subscribe to this podcast. I I am now in Hackaday.io. Uh, I've created a page. I don't know for how long, because I don't think that's what Hackaday.io was intended for, but nobody said anything. Everybody seems to be happy with me posting my podcast there. So, if you're in Hackaday.io, you can go ahead, go over there and, and follow me on that. If you're on YouTube, you can find my podcast in there and 
I do advise, well, I say advice, I want you to actually go ahead and, um, and follow me on YouTube because I will be releasing videos which will kind of go hand in hand with these topics I'm talking about. So it's not just going to be about business and stuff like that or building boards and stuff, but I do recommend going for it. And uh, what else? I think that's it on Twitter. That's it. If you're feeling, if you're feeling social, you can find me on Twitter. My username is Optical Worm and my company's Twitter account is Hashdefinelec. So see you there. Bye. <music>